Hello, everyone. Thanks for attending my talk. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, and thanks for all the questions that you guys uh, submitted. So um, let's see where to start. Um, the first question was, why don't other blockchains require a hard fork combinator and what are the trade-offs? So that's that's quite a good question, actually. And it's an, inter it's an interesting one, but it's not completely obvious what the trade-offs are. Um, so in IOHK, we've made the decision from the very beginning that, um, that we want to be able to trace the history of the chain all the way back to Genesis. We felt this was the most honest uh, approach. So no matter when we switch from Byron to Shelley or from Shelley to Gogan or past that, you will always be able to take that chain and trace the history of the chain and validate the entire chain all the way back down to Genesis. We felt this was the most honest way to do a blockchain and the blockchain should be immutable. Now, if you really have a hard fork, that immutability is not, not the case anymore, right? I mean, when you are doing a, like a hard fork in the traditional sense, what you do is you stop the system and you have some sort of idea, okay, some, some agreement. We're now going to change the blocks or maybe we're going to change how we interpret the blocks and, and then we restart the system and we go back again. But this means that I can no longer validate the history, right? Now, if I look at this thing, I get a different view. The history changed. We've rewritten history. And at IOHK, we decided that is not what we want to do. Um, we didn't feel that was the right thing to do on the blockchain. And so we instead um, uh, made sure that we don't do that and that we maintain all the history all the way down to, to, to Genesis. Now, there are um, downsides to this. Because, for example, what it means is that when we transition to Shelley, the Byron Ledger is not um the code for the byron ledger is still needed right in order to validate the byron chunk of the chain we still need the byron implementation um when we move from shelley to gogan then uh for to validate a byron shelley gogan chain we need the byron implementation shelley implementation and gogan implementation and so we have to maintain all of these um ledgers in order to validate the entire chain so there is for IOHK, for the developers and for the maintenance of the system, there's overhead involved, right? We have to maintain all of these systems, all of these ledgers, um, keep them up to date, make sure that they keep working. Um, um, but the benefit then for the users of the chain is that we never rewrite history, right? You can always start at any block, go all the way back to the beginning. The rules for every ledger are very clear um, and you can always trace back to, to the very beginning. And so we never ever try to rewrite um, history. Um, then there was a question, are there any other applications of the hard fork combinator other than cryptocurrency? Um, and one thing that's important to realize is the consensus layer actually makes zero assumptions about what the ledger looks like, right? Uh, we don't, as far as consensus is concerned, we run with some ledger right now on mainnet that's byron on the shelly testnet that's shelly um but it could just as well be something else entirely it doesn't have to be a cryptocurrency there are some requirements for example in order to run preos we need some sort of concept of stake right so um if you are running something which is not a cryptocurrency you will need to have a different concept of stake um but there's no reason why that couldn't be done and so you could run an entirely different blockchain um which is not a cryptocurrency, but still used in the hard fork combinator to, to track the evolution of the, uh, of the chain. Um, and there was a question. I like the name of the telescope. It's very fitting. How did you come up with the name? And did you realize that you had designed it as a telescope thing, or did you realize that you needed something like a telescope? So actually, that's a, ni a nice question. And it's a, it's, um, the name telescope actually has a history. It's got a, quite a long history. And it comes from type theory. So my own background, my PhD is in, in type systems. And in, especially in dependent types, the, the name telescope is, uh, is an important uh, concept in dependent type system, where, um, where when you are type checking a program, then you can have multiple type variables. And a telescope in that context is uh, is a is an environment in which we do type checking and then in which every type variable can refer to every previous type variable and so the more type variables you introduce the sort of the further you extend this telescope and the more type uh, type variables you you know the more things you can refer to in your in your type variables so it seems like a, a related concept is not quite the same but it seems um, i mean 
for me that came sort of a natural concept and it fits the same sort of concept fits very well here right i mean every time that we switch to the next ledger we have a little bit more state we're accumulating a little bit more state now one thing that i should point out maybe that i mentioned in the talk but maybe it wasn't emphasized quite so clearly is that it doesn't necessarily mean that we are maintaining the full state of the ledger across all eras right we there's this security parameter that i mentioned right there's a we are we the Ouroboros uh, analysis that the papers that the crypto researchers uh, have written um, are prove prove to us that we never have to roll back more than a certain number of blocks in order to maintain uh, uh, consensus, and so that's a useful property that we have in consensus and that we can take advantage of, and so that means that when we are around this transition point, right, where we're between Shelley and sorry Byron and Shelley. At this point, we have to keep both the final Byron state and the initial uh, Shelley state. But um, when um, once we are more than k blocks into the Shelley era, we know that we will never roll back back into the to, into the Byron era, and so we can be sure that we can now throw away um, the Byron state. Um, now, of course, if you're validating the entire chain, you will then reconstruct the Byron state until you get to the transition point and reconstruct the Shelley point, uh, Shelley, uh, Shelley state, and then move on. But once you move on, once you get to your blocks deep, which in reality, by the way, is 12 hours, um, then the old Byron state can be can be thrown away. Um, then there's a question. Uh, do you think Cardano will ever move to multi-chain similarly to Polkadot or incorporate multi-chains? Um, quite possibly, actually. Um, it's not really my area of expertise, um, but uh, you should watch the talk on Hydra. There was a talk on Hydra yesterday, a very good talk, very nice talk, uh, where they talk exactly about this concept. So Hydra is exactly about running sort of off-chain ledgers, multi-ledgers, and then incorporating them back into the main chain. So um, yeah, go watch that talk. It's uh, not really my area of expertise, so I... Uh, I I don't want to say too much about it, but it's a very good talk, so I I can recommend that you uh, that you watch it. Um, then there's a question: Could you have done this in any language other than Haskell? Um, hmm. Now, of course, I'm a big Haskell uh, fan. Uh, my job is a Haskell. I mean, I uh, work as a Haskell consultant. I teach Haskell. Uh, so I'm a bit biased uh, to answer this question, but um, now of course anything is possible, right? You could have written this in a semi language if you were so inclined. But um, I think I think um, one of the big advantages that Haskell gives us is strong types, right? And so the hard fork combinator is a complicated piece of software. Like we're 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 managing all kinds of aspects of, this, of the consensus layer that right? I showed you, like all the different, like the mempool and the forging of the blocks and the chainsing protocol and, and all of those stuff. And it's and I only showed you the sort of high-level stuff. It's it's quite a big piece of software. Um, and so the Haskell type system, we're using virtually all of the <laughs> extensions in Haskell, but um, we're using the full power of the Haskell type system to express all of the properties that we are, uh, expect from the underlying ledger, how we move forward, what the components are, what those components need. And so in order to um, in order to, to write a hard fork command, those types really help, right? They really help me express what we need to do, when we need to do it, and moreover, the hard fork combinator, the initial design was, you know, something that we thought hard about and then we implemented. But then as we implement it, you know, we discover, oh, you know what? In our initial design, we missed some things. There are some things that we didn't think about. And so one of the powers, I think one of the powers where Haskell really shines is refactoring. Right? Once you have strong types, um, and those types really need to be strong for the consensus layer because it's so abstract, then once you start to refactor, the types tell you precisely what you need to change and where. Uh, I don't think, me personally, I don't think I would have been able to do uh, to develop something like a hard fork combinator without the support from the type system. It's it's something I rely on quite heavily in order to be able to do uh, complicated things like uh, like this. Maybe somebody else could, but for me, the types really, really, really help. Um, <laughs> there's a question: Why did you not write your code in calligraphy for this play? <laughs> Which is a, a nice question. So I guess it's referring to my, I have a small on the main, uh, in the 
in the foyer, there's a small calligraphy class uh, taught by me. Um, I, I actually thought about sometimes not the, the consensus layer itself, but uh, uh, I did think it would be nice maybe at some point to maybe write something like something simple, like factorial as nice calligraphy. It's uh, something that's on my to-do list. Um, there's a question, should we be concerned about efficiency? Hmm. I don't think so, actually. So although the hard fork combinator is complicated, it in the end only distinguishes between a handful of ledgers, right? Where right now it's Byron and Shelley, it may be Byron, Shelley, Cogan, and maybe in 10 years down the line, it will be 15 or 20 ledgers, who knows? But it's not gonna be thousands or tens of thousands or millions, right? So the overhead of the hard fork combinator is compared to the overhead of doing all the cryptography from the, that the ledger requires, the uh, applying the blocks to the ledger state, computing new state distribution, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I think the overhead from the hard fork combinator is, is minimal. Right now, it's technically speaking linear in how many uh, ledgers there are, how many transitions there are, but the overhead is, is I haven't measured it, um, so I, you know, to measure is to know. So I, I can't say, tell you for sure, but uh, I, I would be extremely surprised if, if the uh, hardware combinator introduces any kind of uh, significant overhead. And even if it does, it would be possible to reduce that linear uh, cost to down to logarithmic. It just hasn't been a, a, a requirement. It's not, it's not been a concern, basically. Uh, So, okay, so I think this is a related question, I guess. Somebody asks, what if you end up with 50 revisions? Will you still keep them all in the types or can you forget distant history? So I feel like I should uh, clarify here that, uh, and again, I said this already, I just want to emphasize again and to distinguish between the type level uh, history and the value level history, right? The type level uh, in Haskell, uh, you. I don't know if you know this, but uh, when the Haskell pro program is compiled, it, types are gone, right? At the runtime, types don't exist. So the overhead from the types on the runtime of the system, the performance of the system is, is very small, uh, or basically none. Um, now, that's not to say that um, there's no cost. Of course, the hard fork combinator needs to just, you know, distinguish between which eras we are in, but I already you know, tried to argue that this cost is, is minimal. There is a cost at the language level, right? I mean, um, the larger types, the more complicated it gets. However, even there, it doesn't really change anything. So the hard fork committer itself is completely abstract. It doesn't know about Shelley, Byron, Gogan, or anything else. It, it just says, well, we have a bunch of errors. It doesn't even know what those errors are. It doesn't, it doesn't need to know. So it's whether we have one hard fork or a million, the hard fork code itself is exactly the same. Um, there is a tiny little layer at the very outset where we instantiate it to the, the concrete case that we need on the Cardano chain. So there for Cardano, if you, the more transitions you have, the larger your type will be, but that is literally right now a module of containing, I don't know, maybe 200 lines of code, like it's tiny, there's nothing there, right? So yes, that module would get larger over time, but I don't think in any, uh, in any important way. Now, if you really wanted to, of course, you could at some point decide, you know what, we don't need this requirement anymore that we want to validate the history all the way back down to Genesis. And so we're going to do a hard fork. And in this hard fork, we're going to just sort of erase part of the history and just pretend it was all a Shelley ledger or all a Gogan ledger or all whatever. Uh, but I strongly suspect that this will not happen, right? IOHK, the whole reason that we developed this in the first place is that we do not want to erase. Uh, history. We want to be able to track the history all the way down to the Genesis block. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind again is that even though at the type level the history grows, at the value level what we keep in memory doesn't grow, right? Except across uh, around these transition points, there we uh, restore temporarily the final Byron state and the initial Shelley state or the final Shelley state and the initial Gogan state or whatever. But as soon as we are more than k blocks deep, into the next era, those just are not necessary anymore and we can just uh, throw them away. Um, so then there's a related question, does all this abstraction make integration difficult? Um, 
I would say no, actually. So, yes, when I explained the telescopes, uh, I talked about all those functions we acquire, right? all those translation functions and the retraction functions, and it looks quite abstract and difficult at the at that level. But when you get down to the concrete instantiation, all those requirements boil down to very simple functions, right? For Byron, it boils because we have only one transition. It boils down to basically. We need a translation function from the final Byron state to the initial Shelley state, which makes perfect sense, right? I mean, that's what needs to be done. Right? If at the boundary I have one ledger going to another one, I need to somehow translate the state. That makes sense. And then there's a few others. There's two more. One is actually that state is split. There's some state that belongs to the ledger, like your state distribution, etc. And there's some state that belongs to the consensus layer. For example, Prails needs to maintain some nonces for entropy on the chain. So there's two bits of chain two bits of state that need to be translated and um uh i talked a little bit about this forecasting business so when we are validating headers uh we need to sort of predict what the state will be right because we have headers that are ahead of our chain and so when we are right at, at that transition point we might need a forecast that crosses that transition point and so we need a translation there of the forecast as well so those three functions are there but once you have a concrete instantiation for Byron, it will be very concrete, right? I need to have this type, I need to make this type. So it's, I don't think integration is particularly difficult. Um, then how does chain selection work across eras? So that's actually quite a, uh, an interesting question. So, um, uh, so in Ouroboros, the basic Ouroboros algorithm as the crypto researchers describe it, um, Chain selection is very simple. You pick the longest chain, right? Everybody submits their chains and you pick the longest one. Now on concrete ledgers, that's a little bit different. So for example, in Shelley, there are some additional requirements. Um, in, for example, there's two, two, two important ones. One is to do with um, key evolution. If you evolve your key, then we prefer, if you have two chains which are signed, with the same key, so but one has a newer version of the key, then we prefer the one signed with the newer version. And the, the reason for this is that if the key gets compromised and the key holder gets it, makes a new version of the same key and produces a new block, then we should prefer the one with the new block, right? Um, and then there's another one to do with uh, entropy that uh, makes chain uh, selection a little bit more deterministic. So there are some tweaks. Now, if we have two chains and we look at the tips and we say, which one do we, do we prefer? We still have the same basic rule. We want the longest one. Now, if the longest one, if the two chains are in the same era, that's no problem, right? We just apply the chain selection from that era. But if we have one tip that's in, say, Byron, and one tip that's in, say, Shelley, then uh, then we might have to do something special. And um, the the basic idea is we stick to the basic the core rule in Ouroboros, which is we pick the longest one. Now, if we are going from Shelley to Gogren, for example, they will both run Prayas or Genesis or Boris Genesis. And so they run the same consensus algorithm with a different ledger. Now, in that case, of course, we can just apply the exact same chain selection rule, no matter whether we are in the same era or not, because the chain selection rule is the same and we have the same information. Um, okay, uh, I don't think there are any further questions. So if that is the case, then thank you very much and um, enjoy the rest of the summit. Thank you very much. Bye.